Hello, and welcome to today's Wired Briefing, the evolving world of CIOs. I'm Nick Compton, contributing editor at Wired UK. In today's briefing, we'll be exploring the role of the modern CIO, how that role is changing, given that all companies are tech companies now, how CIOs drive strategy, create value, but also manage the adoption and application of technology at a very human level, and look at what other transformative technologies are on that way. And with that, I am delighted to be joined today by Art Hu, the Senior Vice President and Lenovo Group Chief Information Officer, to take all that on. Since his appointment to CIO in 2017, Art has reshaped Lenovo's IT organization to focus on driving innovation and creating business value. Under his leadership, IT has become a critical enabler of the company's transformation into a full service technology solutions provider. Art, welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you very much, Nick. Pleasure to be here. And uh, first of all, I guess we should um, simply define terms. Uh, what, what is a CIO, a Chief Information Officer, especially as distinct to a, a CTO, how you see those distinctions? Um, and how much the roles really are concerned with how technology is used within a company and how much is it concerned with technology, consumer facing or customer facing technology? Yes, it's an excellent question to start off with. Well, CIO and CTO have and are used differently across industries, but broadly speaking, if we were to try and identify a theme, I think CIOs have historically been focused on identifying, integrating, and deploying technology in a way that creates value for their organizations. CTOs, or chief technology officers, have more traditionally been focused on creating new technology and intellectual property for long-term competitive advantage in their companies. Now, that being said, with technology, as you just pointed out, figuring much more prominently in many companies' offerings, that line is blurring. Even if you take Lenovo as an example, historically, we focused on building the core systems within IT. But over time, we've taken on building externally facing technology, including our e-commerce site to our end users, partner portals, supplier portals. And even more recently, in addition, we've also, as part of a program that we call Lenovo Powers Lenovo, we're taking the best of what IT does and could be attractive to our customers. And we're productizing it for external use. For example, hybrid cloud management solutions. So we're taking even that on. At the end of the day, if you have the competency, I think regardless of if you're a CIO or a CTO, there's a pretty broad space for identifying, integrating, deploying, and creating technology to deliver value for the business and the broader ecosystem. But I guess there's no uh, kind of one size fits all model and every organization has to think, you know, what the, what the CEO role means for that company, what they need out of that role. Um, there's, there's no kind of simple definition in that sense. Yeah, Nick, I would agree with you there. This is where each company needs to think about its own context, its organization and its skills. Typically, CIOs will start with the run part of the business, which at Lenovo we call run better. And this is to emphasize the continuous improvement. But this is all about making sure that the day-to-day -day business and that the company can continue on as an ongoing concern. Now, beyond that, you can start to add in delivering new capabilities and transformation, enterprise agile transformation, and even bringing software expertise and project management expertise to the overall portfolio. Relative to what each company is trying to do, I do think it makes sense that they look to see who is best positioned. Again, regardless of if it's a CIO or a CTO or a chief digital officer even, you know, from my vantage point, I would happen to argue that CIO is because we are used to thinking about technology and speaking about it in business terms, in outcomes and objectives that we're particularly well positioned uh, to do so. Right? And that can range across a variety of activities from renovating and modernizing core systems like ERP to agile transformation to intelligent transformation, what we call new IT, as well as figuring out how to get data and analytics into every part of the business. Yeah. And um, given, given that, you know, all, as, as we say, all, all companies are technology companies, technology is embedded in everything most companies do, can we dig into the, the relationship now between the CIO or CTO and the CEO and how that is changing and, and how, you know, and I, I guess how much is Paul and how much is 
pull in terms of the CIO bringing new technology to the table and all the CEO or others in the C-suite demanding new technologies. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack in that, in that question. So I would say that in general, not just the CEO, but the C-suite uh, absolutely at each company has to raise its own game and become much more conversant in the language of technology and how to think about it. At Lenovo, as we lead into intelligent transformation, it's kind of the new IT, it's not just information technology anymore. But as we lean into this new IT, the senior leaders are realizing that they all have a stake. So for example, we're, we've committed to doubling our technology R&D spend within three years. And that's much more than just raising a dollar figure. Right? That really means being much more aspirational about what we're trying to do, right? defining and finding new areas in which we can deliver solutions. And so there's a natural pull where the business and the functional leaders are eager to jump in and contribute. Now, to your point about the push and the pull, you'll always have the business coming to you as the uh, IT team, as the CIO. And there's always gonna be something that they wish could be done better. There's always the next partnership, the next functionality, the next system you can do. On the same hand, or on the other hand, you'll always have your own ideas because you see an, a broader landscape outside of any particular one function in silo. So there's very much an integrative role. That's the push-pull. And again, I would argue you want both, I mean, at different times in the life cycle of where a company is and what you're trying to do. Uh, you need both because it's a partnership. Uh, and I think as part of a good partnership, there's a create attention. Right? You don't always want to agree. Right? Uh, you want to have some level of the healthy tension and even constructive disagreement about the possibilities. Uh, but again, I welcome that because I think the, the, under the ethos that good ideas can come from anywhere, you really want to broaden the funnel of where you're hearing input from. And then making sure you have a thoughtful process to filter that down to the essence of what you're hearing and then can go action. Yeah, and kind of moving away from the C suite a little bit, and then just thinking, how, how much is the CEO then? You know, just the the bridge between technology and and employees who are all using different kinds of technology in different ways. How much is your role? Just one of making people comfortable and feeling empowered by that technology and not intimidated and intimidated by it in, in a simple sense. Yeah, so that's a fascinating question. And I think it gets to one of the things that's not often or not talked about as often, right? Because if you look at the uh, CIO journals and the IT journals that talk about enterprise technology, it, t it tends to be on the technology, right? Not, yeah, not yeah. to belabor the obvious, but what's not talked about enough is really uh, the other aspects of the role, right? And I think that is rooted in how to think about value and adoption. Right? Not just getting to a go live, but really getting to the adoption curve so that there is value uh, to be captured. And so in that aspect, I think there's almost a, a, a psychologist role to the job, as well as being a bridge, because then you have to think deeply and understand the business teams that you're trying to work with. What's in their minds? Right? What are their hopes or fears sometimes? And how do you work with them to get beyond that uh, so that you can actually get into uh, the value capture versus the, the fear and misunderstanding phase of the project. So I think it's, again, if you think about the role, not just as delivering technology, but ensuring that people adopt it and capture the right outcomes, then necessarily you have to take on this other hat of kind of psychologist and thinking, mm -hmm. how do you actually get past the barriers on change management to, to really solid adoption? And we, we've already mentioned or touched on data and data analytics and, and data science and obviously, you know, increasingly crucial in, to how businesses run and, and set targets and objectives. Uh, how much is, is the role also kind of communicating that to the wider kind of workforce or employees and making sure they understand what that means and, uh, you know, this, this is tough, difficult technology sometimes to, to kind of explain to people. Yeah, I'm a, I think it's another instance of, of what we just spoke about in that it's absolutely the CIO's job to help demystify that. Right? Yeah. And I'm a huge fan of the CIO helping the business embed data and analytics across the value chain. Uh, and one of the biggest changes to getting there is overcoming, again, either the fear or the uncertainty or the doubt, because maybe people are intimidated by the technology or they're not sure how to 
go about it. Uh, and so getting people into a more generative and open mindset. I like to tell the business teams and even my own teams when we're thinking about how we can apply these techniques to ourselves, if we can't think of how data could be applied, then that's a good signal that we've got to go back to the drawing board because we're experiencing in, the, in that case, a failure of imagination. Uh, and you know, if you think about the things that we've successfully done, it can range from the most specific things in the company, such as how do I schedule shifts of workers to how can I reduce manual operations and order entry? If you move up, you can actually start influencing like, customers and thinking about your customer insights. What are they doing versus what they're telling me? Is there a gap and how do I need to rethink about it? And it can even be at the company strategy level, right? which is as we get and understand customer behavior better, do we have new insights that we can glean that maybe open up new sources of value or business models that we don't even have today? Uh, but as you say, it's not What's interesting is it's you, the CIO plays a role in helping people get into that mindset, but it's absolutely, as we said before, a partnership. The yeah, IT yeah. team can't do it by itself. It has to be a push and a pull. And it's all about creating the right environment to work with the business to create some wins and momentum. Exactly. And that's it's, it's, uh, I've been doing some research on deep uh, reinforcement learning and some of the next wave of kind of really advanced AI. And these are hugely complex technologies that are coming, going to, you know, coming on, starting to be applied in, in kind of enterprise technology or, or, or it's going to make that job more difficult, isn't it? Just as, the, as the technology gets more kind of abstract as well, in a way. Yeah, so this one prevents an interesting conundrum. Because right? in, 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 I, I think there's two things that I, I focus on when thinking about something like AI. The first instinct is to really be practical and outcome focused. As I said, the, the goal of the CIO shouldn't be to put this on a pedestal, right? The goal should be to demystify it and bring it down into the practical to say, look, this is what it can actually do, right? Forget the complicated academic papers, forget the math and the equations and the symbols that people really struggle to understand. Right? Yeah. But how do you demystify it? Because you don't want people to be in awe of something. You want people to grab a hold of it and use it. That's where the value is. And if you don't make it easy, people won't use it. Now, the other aspect of AI that I think for the first time is really substantively different than previous technologies that we've grappled with is this notion of traceability comes up. Right? So this very interesting question of why are we doing this? What led to this recommendation? And in the traditional model of uh, humans running analysis, you just say, hey, show me the model, right? show me the, the chain of logic that led to this outcome, and you can trace the data. Uh, but as AI gets more complex, the techniques, like what you talked about right, with machine learning and deep learning, you can't actually do that very well. Hmm. And so for a business leader who may want to really feel in control and feel like he or she has their hands on all the right knobs and levers to pull the business, Right. You need to, as part as a responsible technology practitioner, it's important to understand the limits of technology to say, hey, we want to make it easy for you to use, but you should understand right? if you ask the model why it did this, you may not get a satisfactory answer. Are you prepared to accept that? And then what happens in the edge scenarios where maybe things aren't going the way that we envision? Right? So the edge cases and the boundary cases become uh, something that I think require education so the business understand how to use it, but also kind of the range with which in which it can generate good outcomes and some of its capabilities and limitations. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting that that idea of how much the CEO's uh, role is as kind of as tech and evangelists and how much is it as the realist who goes, look, this technology is great, you can do this, but it can only do this, you know, and, and just that that kind of balance of saying, look, this is how you use it, these are, these are its limits, these are, these are its potentials. And, and I guess that gets more difficult as time goes by. Yes, it does. Right? I think as technology opens new frontiers, right? I think uh, people, there's a natural learning curve of how to use it effectively. Right? And so as we talked about earlier, I think there's the well-understood technologist role. I think there's the translator role, which is helping people figure out what it means, as well as the psychologists of, of not only adoption, but then working through what it means. So. AI here is, is a very good example on another aspect, which is something we also, within Lenovo, as we were pivoting towards smarter technology for all and intelligent transformation, we had to overcome our own team's fears about AI, right? Because people heavily emphasize the artificial part. Right? And when you see, keep emphasizing artificial, artificial, and how smart it is, 
you say it enough times and people start thinking, well, if it's so good and maybe I don't need to be here once the model's in place. Uh, and so I think that was a good example where we had to clarify what we meant and say, look, our vision for AI is really on the augmented intelligence and the better together vision. And then demonstrating through our actions that those weren't just words, right? That we actually, A, were able to generate better outcomes together. Right? And then B, that employees were able to use their skills uh, in either upskilled ways or different ways that was less manual than before. Right? And so yeah. I think that's a, a very good case in point of, it wasn't just the technology, it was also the psychologist to work people, walk people through that cycle of how do you understand and how do I understand this new thing called AI models in the context of my work, right? as well as the, as well as the translator, right, of making sure, okay, and this is how it then translates into better operational results for the group. And what other transformative technologies are, are on the way then to kind of terrify us or excite us and that you are now thinking, well, okay, how do I bring this on, on stream and how do I talk to people about it? Yeah, so I think uh, obviously we've talked about AI and I think we're just scratching the surface just because there are so many more things that we can do, right? Both on the breadth and the depth. Uh, like I said, there's really no scenario uh, and that's not an exaggeration. There's no scenario, there's no function or no business uh, that I look at where we can't apply, uh, apply AI productively. Now, a couple of other things beyond AI. I think security continues to be uh, extremely relevant. So one of the things that uh, I believe has a strong need that I'm excited about is, is really passwordless multi-factor authentication. I think uh, basically since the dawn of time sharing on computers, uh, right, that we've had to deal with how do we do passwords? And I think psychologically, <laughs> we've demonstrated, you know, we, we create these crazy rules around passwords, right? It's got to be 10 characters. It has to have, you know, alphanumeric capital. It's just all these rules that really humans aren't fit to memorize and in ways that are actually counterproductive to overall security. And so I think there's a lot of interesting techniques and tools uh, that should make passwordless and multi-factor authentication uh, much easier easier for humans to use the technology while hopefully making uh, our systems, both consumer and enterprise, safer. Right? So that's one space where I think it's interesting. Uh, and maybe just to pick one more, I think the low code tools space is also up and coming. Uh, and it's kind of weird as a CIO to say this because it actually means uh, giving up some control because what <clears throat> low code tools do is really democratize the ability of a broader set of users than we're able to before to harness the power of these platforms. Uh, but again, I think because the point is we want to embed technology and we want to encourage experimentation, I think that opens up a new frontier. Right? And it's not really IT's role to prevent that. And I think that's almost you know kind of fighting the tide or wishing the tide wouldn't come in. But I think the challenge is really if you want to empower and democratize more people to tap into you know cloud native, cloud first tools, and platforms, well, how do we put in place the guardrails and the governance so that companies can do that while remaining safe and in compliance? So those are just a couple of other things that, uh, you know, around the tech space that I think are exciting and have a lot of potential. And how much do you also have to, going away from the kind of uh, cutting edge, edge technology and just the day-to-day, day-to-day um, -day working technology, you read, people like Cal Newport and other productivity gurus talking about the, the, the kind of emails and slacks, all that system is broken. <laughs> you know, the fundamental and, and, and all that has been, um, you know, certainly the last 18 months have highlighted that, that, that maybe the way we organize our time and the way we're allotted tasks and the way we are kind of receive information isn't as, as, as effective and kind of as good as it could be. How much are you involved in that kind of day-to-day, -day, you know? Yeah, so this is actually, a, this is, yeah. So Nick, this is a huge part of my work because I think about the smart workplace and the digital workplace. And obviously over the last almost two years during the pandemic, I think this has really uh, stretched us and pushed, pulled us in ways that we couldn't imagine before. I'd start with the point that this is a very human-centered design aspect question. And I think this big word that you used is critical, which is systems might be broken. Uh, and that we don't focus narrowly on the technology because I think just as tools can be a force multiplier when deployed properly, 
I, I think they can absolutely have a dark side uh, when misused or put in the wrong context or system in this case. Right? And so you know, I, I think we, I just saw something in the news that Portugal just moved to make it illegal for bosses to text remote workers after formal hours. Right? And so I think that's an acknowledgement. We have to acknowledge that we haven't always developed the right guardrails so that we can capture the potential of technology without falling into these anti-patterns. Right? If you ever feel a slave to Slack, right? Or you ever feel you can't go to sleep without checking at you know, 12 mi midnight you know, to see if your boss emailed you. That's an anti-pattern. Uh, and so you know, I think the point here is we have to probably reframe it. So rather than do a one-time rethink, because that's reactive, I think the better paradigm as we think about new IT is putting design and experience at the center from the start and keeping it there, right? Keeping experience there as a top level design consideration. It's not, it's just, because it, I think too often traditionally you say, okay, let's deliver the functionality. And then all the other stuff is if I get to it, like security, usability, right? But in reality, you actually want an integrated, you know, user-centric view where experience is as important as the functionality and performance, right? And yeah. so, you know, I, I think this is where the context and the culture of a company needs to be an important partner in this as well, so that people can voice out. So for example, we run regular user satisfaction surveys for our systems. We have company level engagement surveys on processes and tools. And by keeping close to our users, I think that's how we keep the system, right? We look at the technology, the culture, the change management together. Uh, so we're not losing sight of the principle that the technology is here to serve our users and not the other way around, which is what it sounds like when people say the system is broken. Yeah, exactly. So you're kind of a wellness uh, officer as well as a psychologist. <laughs> well, here I'm very happy to partner up with our HR, for example. <laughs> yeah. uh, but yes, right, I, I think uh, it's, 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 an, it's another way uh, where uh, technology can be a positive force when done well. Fantastic. Well, I think I think we're actually out of time, which is uh, such a shame because there was so much more we could have got into. But uh, thanks for your time today and uh, sharing your insight. Pleasure to join you, Nick. Thanks for having me. Um, and if you've enjoyed the session, please do check out other episodes of Wired Briefings at wired.co.uk. Thank you to everyone for watching the session. Stay well and we'll see you soon. Bye.